we connect merchants with technology tools. We're able to make recommendations to merchants based on the size of the business, the growth rate, the internal resources, and their existing tech stack, and say, oh, look, here are three new opportunities you haven't thought of. Welcome to the Milk Bottle Shopify podcast, brought to you by Milk Bottle Labs, one of the world's top-rated Shopify experts. Thanks for taking the time to join us. Our founder, Keith Matthews, interviews merchants, developers, fellow agency owners, and Shopify folk to share as many Shopify tips and tricks as possible. From our base in Ireland, Milk Bottle Labs upgrade, migrate, manage, and advise some of the highest performing Shopify stores worldwide. This podcast is kindly supported by our favorite Shopify app and the only app we install in every store. Rewind.io, the leading backup solution for your Shopify store. Now over to your host, Keith Matthews. Hey there, welcome back to the Milk Bottle Shopify e-commerce podcast. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Derek Haney. And Derek is the founder of e-commerce tech and he provides a wonderful service, which I have spoken to many, many people about over the last few years. And what he does is he helps Shopify store owners choose the right technology to add to their store to boost sales. And as e-commerce evolves and as the Shopify platform evolves, there's no doubt about it that it's becoming more complex to be successful and it's becoming more complex to actually successfully manage a Shopify store. And choosing your tools and your apps and your platforms is also becoming more complex. So here goes. Derek, how are you? Doing great. I'm really happy to be here. Thank you very much. We are on completely different time zones. You are in California, is that right? Yes, it's 10.13 a.m. here. Okay, so it's quarter past five with me. Derek, we are mutually part of Kurt Elster's Slack group, which is a wonderful group of people. And I've mentioned Kurt a couple of times on the podcast, and that's how we've met. We've also met because I'm very interested in what you do. So just to kick off, explain to people what you do and what is the e-commerce tech stack. I think this problem exists for all merchants. I've never talked to somebody that really truly had a 100% grasp on it. And I can be certain that they don't because my whole job is dedicated to e-commerce technology and understanding the landscape. And I still don't have a full grasp on it. So what we do is we connect merchants with technology tools. We're able to make recommendations to merchants based on the size of the business, the growth rate, the internal resources, and their existing tech stack and say, oh, look, here are three new opportunities you haven't thought of. Or, oh my God, you've got this giant hole in your stack. You're not doing SMS. You have no review management platform. You haven't started with a loyalty program yet. You need to get on that, right? So we're, we're able to, and of course, there's some really basic components that I think everybody should basically have in place from day one, but there's a lot of things that change as your business grows that need to develop as your business grows that become emerging problems when you're at 1 million, 5 million, 10 million, 50 million, things change. And so having a plan, an actual plan on what tools to implement at what stage of the business, as well as a little bit more of looking on the horizon as far as what you'll want to invest in technology, I think is extremely helpful to merchants. Right now, everybody does it this way. Oh my God, there's a big fire. What, what tool can I find to, to, you know, go put it out? So they go search online. They ask a couple of friend groups. They go with the top rated tool, you know, or the, the one that just happens to bubble to the surface that day. And then they don't know how well that's going to integrate with the rest of their stack or even if they should have implemented that solution today as opposed to another hole or problem that they could have been focusing on. So that's kind of a, in a nutshell what we try and help merchants with on a daily basis. There's a kind of a failure within the Shopify system, isn't there, the ecosystem, because what you mentioned there about scaling, getting to a million or five million, what tool should you use? In the Shopify world, it's just based on price, isn't it? You know, you sell a thousand orders per month, well, then you go up to our next plan. But there's nobody really analyzing whether that tool is the right tool or not, which is exactly what you're doing. Isn't that right? Yeah, I I think the hardest thing, you know, to do as a merchant is look at the Shopify app directory and discern between two basically seemingly the exact same tools. The truth of the matter is with over 47 apps going live in the Shopify app directory last week, right? There's nobody that's keeping track of which ones they should use versus which ones they shouldn't. And sadly, a lot of these apps are basically copycats of others and they're not really market leaders in their space. And it's not that they aren't valid or can't 
can't be successful for a merchant. It's that you're just, you just might kind of stumble upon a tool in the app store, install it, and you're not really sure if it's going to be good for the growth of the business. And then later on, you might uninstall it. There might be leftover code. It might still be slowing down the site. You know, this is a, is a smaller underlying problem of how merchants are currently going through this process. But when you look at the Shopify app directory, it is, it's very convoluted and it's very confusing. And even going outside of that and looking at like, which email service provider should I go with? Do I have the right one? I think everybody's always asking themselves whether, you know, the, their current provider is good enough for them. And, and so, you know, you're always looking for the best new shiny, shiny thing. And, and it's, it can be a, a struggle to, to balance that and even the anxieties that arise from, from worrying about that kind of stuff really, you know, it, it can, there's a sense of security that I, I hope to give to merchants. When we look at the stack, we say, yes, in fact, these are great solutions. Here are the gaps. Here's the plan. We will go into it in more detail in a few minutes, but I'm really interested in your past because you, you have an agency background. You worked with Gorgeous. You know, the indicators that I get from that experience is the fact that you do understand completely what challenges store owners have. So just go back to your history, because you were an e-commerce entrepreneur in Magento at one point, weren't you? <laughs> yeah, that was uh, that was my first failed. Well, yeah, maybe first, second, first failed entrepreneurial experience, I'd say. Before that, I was playing uh, high stakes poker and th- that was going really well. My wife was selling art at trade shows and like uh, on the street, basically with a pop up tent. And we said, hey, why don't we take this online? We, you know, our we're young, we can figure out the internet, yada, yada. I think Upwork was even a thing back then. I forget exactly, but we got a few bids. Maybe it was freelancer.com or something from some agencies to build us a website. We found one, we paid them 10K. They built this clunky Magento site. It was a real big pain in the ass to get everything uploaded. And then we realized we had no idea on how to sell. So we'd spent all of our money on getting it built and then had no clear go-to-market strategy. I and mean, this was before I was even truly, I, I don't think I would call myself a marketer at that time in my life. And, and it was it was just a great, a great failed experiment. And the learnings I took from it were, were really, you know, that, that was my alt MBA, or at least the first part of my alt MBA. I have other failures that we could go through as well. But that one just reminds me about the importance of starting with your market and how you're going to get into the market and then building a business around that as opposed to the whole spend all the time on my product and then release it to the world and hope people show up kind of thing. Yeah, but Derek, there's also a school of thought that has evolved over the last while. The product people should just stay worried about the product and get it to the market. And some of these things actually work themselves out. But I suppose your point is, is that you could end up as an individual with multiple different apps sitting in a store. You're paying for them, you don't need them, and they're not actually working together. Isn't that kind of part of your logic behind e-commerce stack? I think when we're, we're talking about now on the technology side as opposed to the merchant side. So on the technology side, I do think you have you should start with a strong go to market strategy. And I think this is missing for all technology products. So launching in the Shopify app store actually reminds me a lot of launching a new product on Amazon because you're relying on that third party's existing traffic for you to get a lot of leads and sales and new customers. Now, that can't be the only go to market strategy that some apps have. You do need to think about Am I hitting the right market segment? What happens if I need to go up market more, right? Like, how am I actually going to keep retention on this on this tool uh, and, and things like that? So you really need to understand there's a great article by Brian Balfour, which is called Product Market Channel Model Fit. So it's not just product market, because when you decide that your market is, let's just say it's the starting store, early stage store, right? And you're launching an app into that market. Well, if starting stage stores don't have a lot of money, so you have to be at a low price point. If you're at a low price point, then you can't do things like, I don't know, sponsor a large event and you can't do things like enterprise sales. So you can't have a really robust sales team. You can't be spending a lot of time with each customer because then, you know, if you're spending 10 hours getting somebody to pay $5 a month, that's obviously not a scalable, successful solution. So you really have to care about virality, you really have to care about retention. So you need to be thinking about how those things are built into the product. If this product is, you know, something that basically solves a problem once and then can be uninstalled on the site, that's not going to align with the business model. So you do have to think from the product standpoint, well, how am I going to build this in order to get to market? I, I think that's that's very important. And on the flip side, if you can't see a path to, into a market, then you, you shouldn't be building the product. At the same time, people that are really great at building product should have that kind of knowledge and then continue to build, yeah, and stay focused on product. There are plenty of great 
product led growth businesses and, and successful businesses where, where the product is really innovating in the market and that innovation naturally carries the growth of the business. It's carrying both retention and virality and, and referrals in, in that way because people are like, wow, this is amazing. And, and then they, they tell the next person and case in point is gorgeous, which is very product led growth. They I just have some great innovations. Merchants love them. And then that merchant just talks to another merchant casually and they get onboarded. And that was the you know start of the growth rate of, of that company before it's, it, it's reached where it is today, which is a bit more of a marketing machine. So is it a case then that it's only the successful apps that are in the, let's say, the Shopify app store then that are actually thinking of changing, allowing customers to adapt? I see customers flip to the merchant, I suppose, without trying to confuse people. Yeah. If we flip back to the merchant, the merchant is purchasing a product that has been created by an app developer. But the app developer is just focused on installs and downloads. Like it's only when you actually uninstall an app or you downgrade your price plan that you may even get any communication whatsoever from the app developer. Like we see Shopify store owners that never audit their apps. So in your experience, given the fact that you're analyzing effectively both, I have to compliment you because what you're doing, I think, is something that a lot of people have actually thought of, or maybe that would be a good idea, but you're actually doing it. So in your experience, is it a case that there is a lot of, number one, app developers not evolving their product to suit the market? And number two, on the other side, is there merchants out there that are paying for apps that they don't need or possibly losing revenue as a result of not having the right apps, as you say, in their e-commerce stack? Yeah, th there's definitely a problem that's arising here, which is actually similar to the rise of the e-commerce entrepreneur. So when e-commerce got easier about 10 years ago, especially with Shopify, so maybe even a little bit later, there's this rush into the market. And previously, it was like all about drop shipping and Alibaba. And this has evolved now into more of the digitally native vertical brand side of things. And so there's this gold rush into, into e-commerce. And with the gold rush into e-commerce comes the technology and provider scene. So agencies, consultants, technologies, 3PLs, and all that stuff now providing for them, there's actually this micro gold rush in the Shopify app store where one really basic, like a discounting tool, there's, I don't know, 400 discounting tools probably in the app store, you know, one basic like solve or fix solution could actually net me, you know, a couple dozen or a couple hundred customers at $5 a month. And then I've got this little thing going for myself. Unfortunately, this does not have the merchant's best interest at heart. This is uh, oftentimes these apps are developed and not well maintained, which means when they break, like the site breaks, which is really dangerous for a growth stage merchant. So in the early stages, you might look for cheap solutions as a merchant when you're, you know, very young and you don't have a lot of money to spend. But if you want successful, sustainable solutions, you need to know that the apps you have installed are going to fix the next update or uh, be GDPR compliant or you know, the next uh, Java, uh, JavaScript or cookie update or Google Chrome update, they need to align with where your business is heading. And that unfortunately is really tough to do at a low dollar point price point. Giving it back, passing this back to the technology providers listening today, this is part of the problem with your product market channel model fit is that because you've targeted a very small app that does a very small thing and makes a very small amount of money, relatively speaking, you have limitations in how you can do customer development because it feels, you know, it's unsustainable to have a customer success manager for $5 a month tool. So you, you, in a lot of ways, you're, you're not going to be in touch with merchants the way you need to be to build the next great thing. And you're all, and because your solution is small. And so the, those small solutions, some companies like Bold Commerce has done a great job. They built multiple small solutions and now it's really a suite of tools that can be very valuable for merchants. And there's, of course, um, Shoppad and a few others that have done uh, similar in tool suites. Once they hit this, the suite, spot, haha, uh, they, they, it becomes viable because you've got 10, $5, $10 a month solutions. So I do like those types of providers and we see them kind of emerging in a few places. It's the, you know, set it and forget it mentality of building an app that I really want merchants to stay away from. It, it can be dangerous for them. In a way, you're kind of trusting Jay and the team at Bold to make multiple updates and be constantly ahead for the customer so they don't have to worry about anything. And we can see that they're aligned with doing that because they have a larger base across multiple product lines and they can afford to do it. So for those reasons, you expect that provider to do it. Whereas the smaller fix, the one-off small fix, I don't know, theme update tool or, you know, SEO 
image update tool might be just done from a developer who just wanted to get it done once and they are not going to maintain the system. They're not going to have your back if something crashes. And those tools can work fine for now, but th- there, it's going to be hard to say that this is going to change my business forever. You know, there's no, there's no $5 a month tool that makes you $10,000 a month as a merchant, right? Like that's, that doesn't exist. Yeah. So the, the money you put in and the value you get out are typically well aligned, usually in a 10 to one, maybe 20 to one scale. Let's take a short break and I'll share the one app we install on every Shopify build. The team at Rewind.io have developed the leading backup solution for Shopify. Did you know there is no way of recovering lost data from a Shopify store? Rewind.io automatically backs up your store data. In the event of a data loss, usually due to human error, Rewind enables you to rewind your store back to its previous state. It's so simple and is used by some of the world's leading Shopify agencies, such as Kurt Elster of EtherCycle and Kelly Vaughan at the Top Room. If your store is gaining traction, you may have multiple users making changes. Often store owners allow team or app developers enter a store to add code. Sometimes mistakes happen and data gets deleted. You can reduce your business risk today and prevent a costly catastrophe by installing the Rewind.io app on your Shopify store. Get your first month of Rewind for free by simply responding to any of the welcome messages or emails you receive after you begin your seven-day trial and mention this podcast. Now, back to the interview. I interviewed Edward Upton from Little Data recently for the podcast, and he gave me an interesting little nugget, and he was telling me that Shopify's dashboard is based on Analytics 2 data, when in actual fact, Google is now up at Analytics 4. Now, not going to pretend to be an analytics expert, but... That doesn't sound good. Derek, if there's only four grades of, or updates to the overall analytics platform in 10 years, well, then Shopify is well behind. And it reminded me of something that I heard you say in the past, whereby customers are losing out on possible conversions if the analytics that the app isn't sending back, let's say to Clavio, isn't sending the right data. Can you give me a couple of examples? Because the platform and the team at Clavio are good friends of ours. And we see a lot of success. We see customers getting up to 40, 50% of the revenue through automated email. But when I heard you say that, I was kind of thinking, well, hold on. Are we getting 40 or 50% for customers when they should be getting 60? Can you just give, give us that example? Because it's very interesting. This is one of my favorite examples and, and dilemmas when you're using multiple different tools to accomplish, let's say, one goal, which in this case, we'll, we'll just say this goal is sending an abandoned cart email. Okay, so we're, we want to we want to send as many abandoned cart emails as we can. In order to do that, we need to have as many email addresses of usually non customers. You know, now it can be a customer that's repeat purchasing, but essentially anybody that adds to cart. Of course, we're getting hundreds of add to carts with anonymous users. They're not giving us our email address, and we can't follow up with them. But there's this actual different problem sometimes, and I'm not sure if it exists for you or not. So as a merchant, you need to go look at this. You need to say, is my pop up tool collecting the email address? Also able to tell my email service provider, who's typically sending the abandoned cart email, what not just the email address is, but what that person added to cart, right? We need a cookie trail. And so the cookie trail is often lost in the pass of information. So you can create, you can, and I don't know which tools are doing this or what the problem is, but I'll just make an example and somebody needs to go check my work here. Let's say Privy is your pop-up tool and Klaviyo is your email service provider. And I know that Privy has new functionality, but let's just waive all that. So Privy collects the email address, sends that email address to Klaviyo. Klaviyo's like, great, we've got a new email. And Clavio is just sitting on it. Now, Clavio doesn't see that that user is browsing the site because Privy sees that the user is browsing the site because it was collected on Privy. So Clavio doesn't see that that user added to their cart. The only way Clavio can see if that user added to the cart is how Clavio collects the email address, which is on the checkout page. So if they hit step one of the checkout and they hit the next button, then Clavio will see that they've added something to the cart and it's actually abandoned checkout at this point. So sadly, Clavio wouldn't send as many emails to that top of funnel audience portion because of this disconnect between the two tools. Now, I think, I'm not sure, but I think Privy sends the cookie information over to Clavio because they have a robust integration and those two tools are, are great partners and they know how to talk to each other. The question for merchants is, are yours? If they don't, then you're getting, you're missing tons of money. Yes. Your point really is, is that there is absolutely no way for a busy store owner to understand exactly what they're losing. 
I mean, we could go do a quick analysis of the emails we collected and follow some of these users across their their journey on the site and figure it out. You can also do a couple tests on your own, right? Fill in the form and go abandon the cart and see if it's working. But oftentimes, you know, people aren't doing those kinds of checks or audits on their own systems or the systems are changing so fast that they're not paying attention. You know, somebody else is handling that. One person might be the director of e-commerce and the other is an email marketer, right? So now you've got two different roles in the company that aren't talking to each other. And then there's other ways to collect emails You might that, that might not be accounted for. And we also have SMS, phone numbers that we want to collect and so forth and so on and compliance. So it gets, it, it comes a jumbled mess pretty quickly. In the last two to three years, it has, be, it has become more complex. I remember having a conversation recently with a merchant when we found Shopify first, it was just the Shopify store. And then they add pause. And now you have TikTok. Now you have Pinterest. Now you have Facebook. Now you have Instagram. And all of those channels are other channels, other sets of data to be analyzed and to be looked at. And to your point, is it is absolutely getting more complex. Now, just to talk directly back to e-commerce tech, okay, and the service that you guys are providing. So when we talk about the e-commerce stack in a, in a Shopify store, it's effectively the apps that are layered on top of one another to try and help you sell more. So what specifically is e-commerce tech doing to make it easier for that Shopify merchants to make those decisions? The first thing is we start by curating some of the more prevalent and bigger needle moving technologies. So truth be told, when I talk talk about like a small discount tool, or sometimes people need a certain bundling, or we need swatches and, and like all of these low, low dollar tools that I have kind of thrown under the bus, but I do respect. I, I We actually don't partner with a lot of them because they're typically smaller solutions. There's a lot of them and anyone will do, which um, we look to understand and analyze bigger solutions that have really unique differentiation. So Gorgeous versus Reamaze, Clavio versus Omnisend. These are like really very similar tools to each other with just minor differences. And that actually throws merchants for a big loop. It's a lot easier to buy something when you're like, this is definitely better than the alternative. When they look really close together, you get this paralysis and you don't know for sure. So we analyze these tools. We actually, we've demoed over uh, 120 different tech partners. So we go in, we do the full demo. We say, treat us like a merchant. Show us how you would sell us. Let's see what you're really made of. Then we'd create a listing based off of that. Some of these listings I've done videos for as well. And that, that's one of the first things we've done to catalog and really understand the tools. And then, of course, by talking with so many merchants and understanding their existing tools and technologies, their problems and all of that, we can kind of map from what we know of the tool providers into the recommendations that we're able to make. And because we partner with all of the major players in a space, so like we have like eight or nine SMS marketing partners, for example. So we don't care which one our merchants are going to. We're able to say, here's the landscape agnostically. Let's look at your internal resources and and your business model. How important is SMS going to be for you? How much of a budget do we have to put into this? Do you have a dedicated marketer for this or is, are you the solo CEO putting this together? And by understanding those things, you naturally weed out a few options. And then in a space like SMS, it's oftentimes it's still like, here's two or three options, but at least we've narrowed it down. And here's our write up on these three that you can take a look at. Might have to demo two of them and then make a decision yourself. If I'm a merchant and I come to you, you guys assist me in choosing, you know, let's say my next email marketing platform. Is that your relationship over with that merchant? Do you push out a a monthly newsletter to share with people the latest apps, the latest apps to consider? Like, how does that kind of relationship with the customer work? We hope the relationship isn't over. Our goal is for merchants to come back to us for every technology purchase decision that they have. So yeah, it can start with email service providers. And oftentimes merchants actually come to us kind of really late in the process or after some sort of regret with some some choice they just made. I just had a merchant purchase Helium 10, which is an Amazon marketing tool at $90 a month, a phenomenal tool. But I was like, why you don't you don't need this tool. You're not even you're not using it. You don't even know how to optimize your Amazon listings. Slow down. Stop, stop and go back. So yeah, after we talk with the merchant, we send the recommendations, we keep in touch. We're actually now using that merchant store data and application data to predict the next tool that they're going to need and then send recommendations ahead of time. Oh, it looks like you're growing to this order and met number. 
is that translating into this number of customer service inquiries? If so, it might be time to put a help desk in your three month roadmap, right? And hire a customer service agent. So we can, we can predict where the business is going to be heading, where the next fire is going to be, and then preemptively make recommendations. We can say, hop, let's hop back on another call and sort this out together. And then of course, passing the merchant to the right partners and and trusted vendors so that they can make the final decision. We always want to make sure, you know, our goal is to really show the merchant at least two options in any major category and, and then have them vet those options a bit more thoroughly than what we do. And then they make their final decision. So are you connected to the store to get that data or is that data given to you on a form by the, by the merchant before they sign up? Yeah, and this is a new change in the company, but it's really important now and moving forward as we build technology to make recommendations and not just use consult the cons- consultative process. We get uh, Shopify partner access to the reporting and the list of apps. We don't make any changes to the site, but we're able to pull this data in to make our analysis. You mentioned staying up to date with apps, and that's the other important thing. Even without the company changing and growing and needing to evolve solutions, we have the industry, the technology industry changing, which means opportunities are going to come up for merchants on an ongoing basis. So we have our tool of the week email. And when we discover new technologies, we might think, oh my God, that's great for this merchant we just talked to. And so we go and reach back out to the merchants and say, hey, I just discovered a tool. I'll give you an example. There's this really cool one called Price Stack, which is analyzing all store data to give the suggested product price. It's using an AI machine learning algorithm to suggest a better price for products. They are just crushing it right now. Just a, sometimes it's a dollar, a five dollar change to a product price is making you know the company so much more in profit and in margin. And they can even predict the inventory uh, that you're going to sell based on the price, which is it's it's really phenomenal modeling system. So I love that. Derek, it's funny you say that. I just interviewed, it was Bree Brecker, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. I interviewed him a couple of weeks ago. So his, his episode is going to go live soon. So I could talk to you all day. We're going to have to do another episode. So Derek, I mean, before we go, you've described it very well, but you also make it sound easy. You've taken on a big task, but you've also taken on something. There's clearly a gap in the kind of, you know, app download or install process within the Shopify ecosystem. So in terms of the future, what do you see as the future? You're, you know, you're, you've mentioned that you're connected to stores and you're trying to build a system which will predict without giving too much away. Are we talking about AI or are we talking about like, where do you see the future of the service that you, that you're offering? Yeah, I think, you know, the, the real goal is, is an app recommendation engine that can predict based on store data and Google Analytics data, as well as aggregate merchant data. So looking at 5,000 stores that are maybe doing a hundred thousand more in revenue than you, but in a similar space and being able to say, well, they're using these tool stacks. And then that can help inform where your decision might go. And that being said, Right now, that can only really predict the tools that are in existing use. And we, that has to, it assumes that the world is static, but the world is so fast changing that how are you going to see new, you know, successful apps rising out of the woodwork or that this will work for somebody when it w- doesn't work for other people in that space? So it's really quite a big problem to tackle. But I believe that the answer is there between humans and AI. And of course, AI will eventually take over the world anyway. So uh, eventually there'll be AI powerful enough to solve this problem for merchants. And most importantly, I think it's, you know, it's solving a couple of major problems. The first one is when you buy a solution that you just shouldn't have bought, and now you're paying too much money for, and you're just not getting enough value of it. This is really terrible for the merchant and for the technology provider, because oftentimes that relationship never gets rekindled, even when the technology at a later time might become valuable to the merchant. So if you buy something too soon, you say, oh my God, I just wasted so much money on that. I wasted a bunch of money on Infusionsoft back in the day, locked into a year contract with no email list, by the way, when I bought it, right? So that was a, that was a big mistake. Like I said, I've got lots of failures. <laughs> so, so preventing some of those big mistakes also, auditing the tools themselves, I think, is a, is a great opportunity. So meaning we can see that tool. Let's talk about SMS Bump. We can see what the, we can look at two sets of merchants, merchants that have SMS Bump installed and merchants that don't. And then we can see the change in conversion rate across these large sample sets and make an analysis and say SMS Bump on average increases conversion rate by 0.3%, which, you know, and then we can tie that back to a merchant and say, look, you'll make 0.3% more revenue. Here's how much you'll make. And we can make this analysis. We can make it agnostically. You can't trust SMS Bump to make that analysis. And most importantly, we can say SMS Bump is 0.3%. What's PostScripts? 
increase and comparing those two tools together, who's winning. And we can actually say, you know, there might be some market leaders in the space. Now, again, there's a causal and correlation problem that needs to be solved for and a lot of other things. But I think we have an opportunity to showcase the technology landscape in an agnostic way in which the merchant is truly benefiting from it. They understand the key players in the space and how well they're actually doing. And, and in that way, it's not a, it's no longer about this sales process about, you know, tech companies just like trying to sell, sell, sell and close merchants and, and close accounts. Instead, it's about the merchants having a lot of power and saying, well, you know, I, I see your direct competitor over here. You know, we can we can reach a market equilibrium when when stuff like this happens. There's there's a lot, and which is good for merchants because there's more competition on their vendor side, and then they're making a smarter decision themselves. It's absolutely fantastic. You're helping Shopify merchants make informed decisions as well about the app investments they make. So, Derek, we will talk again. Well done. It took us a while to get this organized, but I have to say it was absolutely fantastic. And we'll put all of the links back into to all of your interests in the show notes. But in the meantime, thanks very much for your time. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Thanks for listening. All of our episodes are available on Spotify, iTunes and Google Podcasts. A special note of appreciation goes to our sponsor, Rewind.io, the leading backup solution for Shopify store owners. Get your first month of Rewind for free by simply responding to any welcome email once you sign up for your free trial on Rewind.io. If you're a Shopify user with an exciting story to tell, reach out to the team on hello at milkbottlelabs.com.